Okay. All right. Now, you know, the development of every nation depends not only on the availability of resources, but how they use those resources and maximize them. Uh, well, developing countries, unfortunately, you know, Ghana in particular, are faced with uh, preference for foreign goods, which leads to uh, inflation crippling the local currency. Now, I, I don't understand it. The prestige that is attached to the consumption of uh, foreign products uh, it's hard to quantify, and it appears that this trend is also becoming the status quo here in Ghana. Uh, attempts have been made by several governments, successive governments, to reduce imports uh, by encouraging local manufacturing industries to take charge of certain sectors. Uh, but it doesn't seem to work. For example, Ghana has been ranked among uh, countries with the highest importation of rice. Uh, not to talk of used clothes and other commodities. Uh, you know, the basic question is: Look, how have Asian tigers like Vietnam, Indonesia, China, how have they managed to capture the market within the space of about twenty years? What are they doing right, and how different are their products from ours? What has accounted for the general acceptance of their final products? That uh, can't be the case in Ghana where our citizens seem to prefer the imported products. Well, uh, look, let's, uh, let's, let's hear what you have to say about it, because we have been talking to some of you uh, about locally produced goods and why you don't seem to prefer them. But before that, do you remember, not so long ago, uh, the, the president met with world leaders and said that we should stop begging the West and look within to solve our local problems uh, because our economies are capable of doing so. Let's listen to the president. I hear a lot about the need to change our narrative and tell our own good story. Ladies and gentlemen, as the saying goes, nothing succeeds like success. If we work at it, if we stop being beggars and spend Africa's monies inside the continent, Africa would not need to ask for respect from anyone we would get the respect we deserve. Over 30 years ago, one of America's most prestigious Ivy League universities offered a course in Mandarin, which for years had virtually no takers. Today, there is standing room only. And it is not because the course is any easier. It is because the position of China has changed. 30 years ago, 20 years ago, China was nowhere near where it is today. China does not ask for any, anyone for respect now. She does not need it. Let us make our continent the prosperous and joyful place it should be, and the respect would follow. Yes, yes, the president sounding uh, very pan-Africanist there. Um, uh, but look, we've also been talking to you, uh, trying to find out why, why, why do you prefer foreign goods? And what exactly is it that you want local manufacturers to do before you start buying from them? L let's listen to some of your views. Two things about the price and about the quality. Sometimes we see some of the prices of locally produced goods are kind of higher than even uh, the ones coming from other countries, which in quotes are sometimes um, not always but higher in quality than our local prices and also sometimes to our local products you when you buy it and then you use it it doesn't last long so it's about the quality and the price well i think we will need to make our local products more competitive you know give them the leverage in our local market um, the reason why we don't patronize so much in uh, uh, local products, as in rice and stuff, is you can get them today, tomorrow you won't get them because they don't have it in large quantity. That's why we go for other sizes more than in Ghana here. So if they can produce it in a large way, they will go for them because in any way, sometimes when a dollar rises up, it affects those those ones in the foreign sides. So we need the local ones because our currency doesn't rise up so much. So if they can produce those ones in a large quantity, we love to buy them. So they should, do, they should try and do those ones as we want it to be. There must be a demand when there's a supply. And when there's a supply, then a demand should be also there. That's what we need. My problem with Ghanaian products is the abnormal pricing. 
because every individual has a way of pricing their goods, which is not fair. We love our people, we love our products, and we love to use what we have. And so every the prices should be affordable for everyone and accessible as well. I go with the flow. What I see and I like, I buy. Mostly, if you go to uh, even the supermarkets and the cold stores, the big, big ones, you don't get to see Ghanaian products. Even common rice, you hardly get to see a Ghanaian rice in the, on the market. The visibility is so, so poor. So, me like that, I have not made a conscious effort not to buy a Ghanaian made product. I don't have any reason not to buy it, but when I see it, I'll buy it. But normally, you don't see it. The manufacturers, they should put more energy and concentrate on the marketing side of their business. They should make their product visible. So they have to concentrate on marketing visibility. Yeah, sometimes their branding doesn't attract. Yeah, and also the prices, they are too high as, for, as compared to the foreign goods. Yeah, that is why mostly I don't buy um, Ghanaian product. And, and, and secondly or thirdly, the quality doesn't, I mean, match the foreign standard. They should improve on their products. Certainly they should improve on their products. So that's uh, just a little bit of what you told us. Uh, later on the show, we're hoping to hear a bit more from you. But today, let's keep our eye on rice. I think we want to turn this into a bit of a series where we have these really important discussions, where we point out really specific feedback to the producers of local uh, goods and services, but not just feedback to them. Let's hear from them also. Let's learn from them also. What goes into what they make? What goes into the prices they put on them? What goes into their marketing strategy, their packaging, their branding, the things that we are criticizing? What goes into them? Okay, so that when you are standing there in the market and you have a choice to make, you will be informed in making those choices. Okay, once again, let me remind you, we have Koji Akoto uh, He's no stranger to radio. Uh, he's an agribusiness practitioner. He produces rice. Uh, we also have Senyu Hossi, who's the executive chairman of HGL, Limited, they're the makers of Go Go Rice, uh, and we're joined on the phone by John Awuni, who is an agribusiness consultant. Uh, John, what a pleasure! Good morning to you. Good morning, and thank you. All right, good morning. Uh, okay, so, um, listen, let's 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 get straight to the, the basics of it today. It is more likely that a, a, a shopper will pick up some Vietnamese or Chinese or Thai brand before they pick yours. Could you, why is that? What are your customers telling you? Well, um, on my way here, I was listening to your conversation and Raymond says something that stuck out for me. Oh, Ghana rice is not nice, so he will not eat it. Mm. Um, <clears throat> we need to understand what rice is and the options on the market. There are about 120,000 varieties of rice, right? Um, if you get used to a certain variety and you eat it consistently and you get introduced to another variety, it might taste different. Mm. So when Raymond says that he ate Ghana rice, he didn't like it, and so Ghana rice is not nice. It's an overgeneralization of the issue. Um, it's like yam. You have puna, you have afasie, you have different types of yam. You will use afasie, what I am, to prepare fufu and it's okay. Mm. You use your puna for your special ampesi and it's okay. Mm. Those who fry yam also would want to use a different type of yam. Mm. Same for beer. There are different beers with different constitutions and different tastes. So that's how it is. Um, for the longest me, time... Just, mm -hmm. just for on that specific point, that, that different types for different things. Yes. You don't tend to get customers say that about the foreign brands that they are attached to. I, I, I'm building on. Okay. Rice is not indigenous to Ghana. Just that over the past decade or, or so, <coughs> rice has gradually grown to be a staple. So now, when you look at the grains we eat, number one is maize. For bangkun, cocoa, kinky, all the different types of kinky, maize, grits, everything for human consumption, animal consumption. Number two now is rice. Rice is indigenously, if you look at the literature, Chinese, Burma, um, Thailand. So we brought rice into the market. Right. Now, when we brought rice into the market, we had the indigenous owners of rice and the rice business bringing us rice. So 
we had back then we had the rice masters choice we had all these other brands that were mm. sold because they were from there they had built their capacity it's a pure trade thing they grow they sell to market so over 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 a very long period mm. they went on advertising campaigns um behavior change campaigns and we got to love rice mm. there were other things that also contributed to to our switch to rice the the hunger that the farming that happened um 83. in 83 and all that we couldn't um, um, produce enough food so stuff like rice maize and all those things came and it became normal so that's a general opening of where we are with rice how rice is and the rice market mm. now if you look at the different types of rice on the market as well people like their long grain rice they say they like their perfumed rice mm -hmm. Right, and somebody has asked me before the perfumed rice. Do we spray perfume into it? <laughs> no, there are some chemicals in the rice, in some varieties of rice, that gives the out that fragrance. That's what we call the perfumed rice. Right, so now we've built capacity, and out of the over 120,000 varieties of rice in the world, there are some varieties that are commercially viable that we've all come to like, mm. and now we are growing them here. So if you look on the markets, for example, if you eat Gogo -Go rice, if you eat Evie rice, if you eat Mr. Rabbit, if you eat Ya Baby rice, if you eat any of the local rice brands, you would realize that with time there's been an improvement. And if I if I gave you Evie rice or Gogo -Go rice, and I gave you any of the other foreign rice brands, served you food without telling you this is local, this is foreign, you would not be able to make the difference. Mm. So that's interesting. What you're saying is that now the local brands are fulfilling this multi-purpose use yep. that the foreign brands seemed to be fulfilling for customers. Yeah. Today, you can't tell the difference. doesn't matter whether you're making jollof with it or mutu or whatever. The local brands will there, meet there are some all the brands, different... There are some brands which don't have the characteristics of the foreign brands. Okay. So right. There, okay, there so are some varieties. So, for right. example, there's X Biker, <coughs> there's Agra, there's Jasmine, and all these other varieties that we grow. And there are some other varieties that some people grow. So, mm. if you are used to your so-called foreign perfumed rice, long grain rice, and you go and eat those things, your first reaction will be, oh, local rice is not nice. Mm. But if you find out the different brands on the market and you chose right based on your established taste, you know that you are, you are, you are, you are eating the right. right. So if you are a regular um, perfumed long grain rice consumer, and you go and take any of the other varieties that are not the same variety, then you say local rice is not nice. But if you're a regular consumer and you eat your Gogo -Go rice, mm. you eat your AVV, you eat your Yabibi, you eat your <coughs> Mr. Rabbit, you eat your Benji, you eat any of the other rice brand, you eat Nana rice, mm. you know that you are eating the same thing. Somebody also says something on the radio this morning, which I want to react to before you ask all your other questions, mm -hmm. that um, why is, um, you use the term, um, you use that term about foreign rice brands and local rice brands. The reason is that local rice brands, when I grow my rice, so my no season rice is coming. Mm -hmm. Within the next one week or two weeks, we'll be harvesting. Mm -hmm. As soon as I harvest my rice and I dry it and I mail it, it hits the market. Mm -hmm. So it's fresh rice. You need very little water to cook it and, and you are gone. Mm -hmm. In some of the other rice markets, some of the produce you eat in this country would have been stored for two, three years before it lands on our shores. Mm -hmm. It was Raymond who said that it's cured. He yes, said, it's cured. That. Yes. It's, it would have been stored for quite some time before it lands on our shores. So in the rice cycle, the probability that you eat a rice brand which is over a year old is almost 1%. Because we grow, we dry, we sell. Except those who probably have storage and want to keep a bit of rice in their storage to wait for a better price to sell. So when you are eating, see rice as your mango, Right. If I harvested mango and put it down and didn't put it down in a very and, and, and didn't store it very well, it's gonna lose a lot of whatever it is. But if you get your fresh mango, you are going you are likely to get a lot of the returns when it comes to nutrients and nutrition. So when you are eating your local rice, you are eating fresh rice basically. That's why you add just a little bit of um, water and it goes. So we have capacity. There's an industry or there's a product that we have brought into our system based on certain economic shifts, certain global, whatever you economics will call it, and it's now become a staple. Mm. 
But over the past 10 to 20 years, we've built capacity enough to be able to grow what you are used to, to serve that to you at even better prices. Mm. I heard people saying local rice is expensive. I can take you through all the rice um, 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 brands we have on the market, the prices and the prices of local rice. And I'll also take you through what it takes for us to grow rice and put rice on your tables. We'll be coming to that, the, the, the manufacturing process and what goes into it. We'll come to that. But Senor, I'd love to bring you in because um, I, I'm sure you have a lot to add to you know what um, Kojo has said. But I wonder if you can address one of the things he's raised, which is that it seems people just have a misconception when it comes to local rice. They think that it is whatever you used to exist that you know they didn't seem to like they think that is all that's available they don't realize that today there are local brands that compete so favorably with their preferred foreign brands i'm asking does that mean that the problem is actually a perception and image one that the image of local rice has not been managed as well as it should when you try google rice i don't see you going back anymore because for us as a business, the foremost thing we have is a customer. What is the current palate of the customer? What do they want? So you actually invest in delivering that quality, that standard that they need. When you build your business that way, you have sustainability. It's quite expensive for us to really compete and get those standards right. And hopefully, once people experience the consistency and the standards, there will be a proper mind shift. People are used to something. If you want to shift it in our case we are not even really shifting it because we are not changing the taste we are giving you something that's better in taste similar to what you have we are giving you mango that's sweeter a mango that's more, more nutritious. nutritious but and cheaper it, and, and, and 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 in time past we had a local industry that was that was very low on standards and i must admit even to date you still have quite some challenges with standards. Not everybody would maybe spend or invest resources, time, and processes to deliver the standard that maybe AGL will to give you go go rice. Others just possibly do a rough meal, sometimes mix different paddy, because, like you said, there are different varieties. <coughs> For me to give you what you want, I give you a jasmine 85. Um, um, what you call it, um, party. Somebody may mix it with, say, an agri variety. All of them cook at different levels. So when you go and cook it, you say you cook local rice, and then you, it tastes. Some part is cooked, some part is not cooked, because the people who did it did not really ensure standardization in the entire processes. So I tell people, I don't sell local rice. I sell go-go rice. Exactly. Mm. So don't box us all up together and say that local rice is not good. Try go-go rice, try FVV rice, and judge FVV rice for what it is. I do not think that people go and say, I'm buying Vietnamese rice. Mm. They say they want to buy royal something. They want to buy something, something. And that's what you go for. Try go-go, try FVV, and see that the standards are different. And the problem we have, is that as a country, and this is where the failing of the Ministry of Agri is, <laughs> they just got it all wrong, and they get it all wrong, because it's all a matter of throwing money, 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 and money, and making big speeches that get us nowhere. Simple things like trying to ensure standardization in the process. You go to a place like Thailand, when you go to an area like Buriram, the mm. variety that is planted in the whole area is defined by the state. The place is standard. The whole place is like what you wanted to drink cognac. Cognac, you're using grapes from the cognac region. For you to grow grapes in there, you have to go through a certain process for you to grow in the cognac region. Otherwise, you can't get a cognac. Yep. You get a regular brandy. Mm -hmm. So these standards are there. When you're a miller and you go and you're buying party in the place, you don't have a problem with the kind of quality you have. But today, as a miller, you get to one area, one part of the field, somebody is doing X by car. Another part, they are doing Agra. Another part, they are doing Jasmine. And you are not sure when you go there they've mixed all up and they are selling all to you at a high price mm. so you come and mill the thing and you're having different kinds of quality in your rice what will you get as an output mm. what i want to encourage Ghanaians: stop judging Ghana, Ghana rice as Ghana rice 
hmm. vet each brand align with each brand and the standardization that people put in there when you start rewarding people for the brands and the standards that they deliver people will also start investing in shaping their processes to meet the standard to win your heart hmm. for us we are in there for the customer is the possibility here it is I tell you the truth. In fact, I've just asked that they bring you rice for you to look at Google Rice. I wish mm-hmm. every rice to come right now. And you will see. And they should bring uh, which one? Do you know whichever it is? They bring it and see. Whether when we put it, we'll do this, you'll be able to tell which one is which. You won't. Mm. The other thing about Ghana rice, or rice made in Ghana, for us, you have fresh crop. It's practically from factory to, to plate. Mm-hmm. But the ones that you take coming from Asia... The people first of all are wise. They don't eat the one that they've stored and stored and stored. That one is more like their buffer stock. They eat the fresh rice. Then the one that they are going to replenish as the buffer stock for food security is what they ship here. So they take fresh one back into the silos, take out old rice and ship it to Africa. Then we too, we are here happy and dancing. Yeah, we've got rice. You are eating substandard. Optimal standard is right here. But we must actually deliver it in a way that meets the customer's needs. That is where we have gotten it wrong on the policy side. But some of us are taking investments to make sure we deliver it. Some people have complained about price. And I tell people, yes, I would rather charge you a premium and deliver the standard than give you substandard and have you judge me like you have been judging everybody. Mm. Because as long as you can actually even pay foreign rice much higher than the one I'm pricing, then I don't think I'm overpriced. But and thankfully, I'll tell you a few things that happened. And during the Christmas, there are a lot of issues about <coughs> price. Party was going for what, 2300 Today, party is practically 6000 It is now that we've gone to this new arrangement with our farmers to try and get it back. So for our Google funds, hopefully next week you should get a better price. And we are not short on selling. Our only problem, really, is that we are not getting the, the, the premium shells. You go to Malcolm, at best, maybe you see copper. Once a while, you want access, you are hardly getting access there. But they are putting everything Chinese, Indian, Pakistan on their table. You go to ShopRite, I don't think they've ever sold any Ghanaian rice. There's no shelf for it. And these are the things that policy must do. Because, when you because have where ma- the money is coming from, that's where the decisions and, are, are made. made. And you see, the other thing too, you have to realize that, look, all these imports and, this, and the things, the gimmicks that go in there, and we all know what happens at the ports. The tax evasion is massive. When we sit back and look at the pricing that they actually put for some of the produce, and you work back to the world market price for these rice, it doesn't make sense. Our own people are conniving with importers, all right, to actually breach the sustainability of the market. Hmm. And that's why I said that, if we really want to fix this, and government saying that we want to ban rice, we want to do this, it's all English. Government's action must actually support the sustainability of it. Forgive me, I'm going to a little preaching mood. Nine days, I'm doing Exodus 5 1. Let my people go. Okay, <laughs> please pay us the money. Let's go. Back to rice. <laughs> <laughs> Look, the market, the market is about a 1.5 million ton market, 1.6 million ton market. Yeah. We are importing about a million tons. So if you want to ban a million tons, that means that you should be able to have capacity to produce that million mm-hmm. tons. You have to step backwards. What type of rice do the people want to eat? Ghana, our palate right now, is not the American number five rice anymore. When you had rice master. Now it is really jasmine. Is there is there fragrant rice? Okay. Perfume rice is what they want. Let's get our seed people. CSI, let's get the optimal one. There is, there is. How do we find a way to, to optimize the yield in that particular seed? Invest in it. Don't let private sector go and be investing with me. I've been spending money trying to go around seed. That money should rather go into my production to save me cost. In Thailand, they don't have to do that thinking. Government does all that thinking properly. Your seed supply is assured. Then there's a structure for people to actually invest in seed for proper offtake. Because the standards are there. The science is there to support it. Mm-hmm. I know what I think. But now I have to go and think all this in 360 as a businessman. Because I want to make sure that when Kojo 
Yansin is my rice. He will judge me for who I am. The rice that Kujo is eating should match the suit that is wearing. Look at the way you are sitting here, fine boy. You must definitely meet my rice. And my rice must be fine rice for you. So I have to invest too much, which under normal circumstances, I won't do because there's a, an ecosystem that supports me. Now, you have to work back now. You say you want a million tons. How much land do we need? If you look at 3.34 uh, average uh, 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 paddy yeah. uh, per, per hectare productivity, it means that you need about 450,000 hectares of land. Rice needs irrigated land for you to have any meaningful um, productivity. Otherwise, you'll be losing money. Mm. The whole country today, the formal irrigation system is under 13 or 14,000 hectares. But you need 450. Before you have the informal one, so if you box it all together, maybe you get 222,000 hectares. This is Ministry of Agri data. Me having gone to measure myself. They, they are data, they only God knows. But <laughs> let's work with that one. You are sharing this irrigation with other crops. For rice alone, what do you need? 450. Yep. Even if you scale it down and you want to run a 1.5 factor, it means that you need at least 300 hectares. Are we investing in that infrastructure? We are not investing in that infrastructure. <coughs> that is what PFJ and all mm -hmm. that should have been doing. Mm -hmm. When you invest in that kind of infrastructure, you're doing the core part. There's a core part of the infrastructure that is heavy, which government could have taken a step on. Mm -hmm. Then we, the businessmen, can say we are expanding the, the canals to reach more fields. Within no time, we can capture this and say we are going to be able to produce. Right now, you are going to say you are trying to say that what they, you are going to stop them from using uh, FX. That's why I question the central bank. Are you sure you are really taking a proper policy if you really want to grow this industry? Because when you say you are not going to allow them to import with your FX, we don't have capacity to meet it. So what's going to happen? They're going to take FX from outside. Who is going to make the money and the, and the arbitrage? Mm -hmm. It is the FX trader. So why don't you rather levy the um, the imports? And come up with a rice development levy so that from that money in these are broke times you can use that money to invest in the infrastructure that can enable the industry prosper yes and i was giving an example government sometimes just needs to build a bridge connect cities then you have business productivity going and then the economy growing that is what that's the kind of intervention we we need not throwing money at things and just say you have bought tractor they, or you have bought uh, fertilizer they are standing there clapping for you after that, it goes nothing. Now, 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 talking about the yield, you've talked about 3.4, sometimes 1.5. How about we also increase the yield to, say, 6 per hectare? Yeah. It is science um, that delivers that um, thing. Who is investing in that? You want Kojo or me to use our coins to go and invest in the science? It is government that has to invest in the science. That's why I say our policy making, we are not thorough. And frankly speaking, I think our mothers who, were, who didn't go to math school even made more better policy making than we actually okay. do after so, our education. So, Senor, you let want me come one in. million tons, don't you know what you have to L do? Let me, let me come in on the, on, the, on the yield. So, your yield is dependent on your variety mm -hmm. and your agronomy. So, there are certain seed varieties that can give you a certain yield and every variety comes with its needs. Mm -hmm. Like human beings, you have to eat to grow. So rice needs a lot of water. That's why Senor is talking about irrigation, irrigation, irrigation. It needs water. Now, rice also needs crop nutrition, which is fertilizer. On average, if you are doing the right protocol, you need about four bags of fertilizer per mm -hmm. acre. Right? Now, if you do this protocol right and you have your crop protection and your water levels and, every, and your seed variety is good, you can hit at least some six tons. Now, if you look at our Greek factor figures, we are doing about 260,000 hectares of rice. If you got six tons per hectare, that should take you to about 1.5 million metric tons of paddy. But that's actually not mm. a variety. I'm, the variety I'm, that the people like. I'm, I'm, so I'm, 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 right. I'm coming. The variety yeah. people like I'm, will not get you to the I'm, I'm coming. If, 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 if you look at the work CSIR and a few institutions have done based on the varieties on the market, and if you wet the agronomy right, you should be getting something right there. Now, earlier, you guys asked me what I thought about the ministries, and, and I said mm. agri is just a ministry of trade, and it's no longer a function of just crop science and animal science and all those things. Buy and sell We have 
a lot of companies bring in fertilizer. They are bringing in seed. They just come to trade it. We can look at the function of those companies and the need of the country to produce what we need. Why couldn't we produce enough food in 2020, 2021, and 2022? We were told there was COVID. There was the global um, haulage problems. And then people were practically broke. So a lot of farmers couldn't buy the inputs they needed to buy. Mm. So they just get their seed. Some of them even planted seed from their previous year's production. And, and do their seeding. No fertilizer application. So instead of getting your four, five, six tons, this person might get one ton for the same field. Mm. Maybe for the same water and the same labor. Now, if we look at the volumes of fertilizer we bring in, the people doing trading in the business and making money and put in place certain structures, we could farm. Now, let me give you an example. Almost all the fertilizer companies in the world have reported over 50 to 100 percent profits. When we are all struggling, we are saying we couldn't buy fertilizer, we couldn't do business, but they are reporting huge profits. Now, when you bring in the fertilizer, it takes me just four months to produce rice. So, you know, I know so. Yeah. How many months? From germination to harvesting, four months. maximum four months. If per the quotas we give the fertilizer companies, we say every fertilizer company should commit 10 to 20% of their fertilizer they are bringing in to uh, verifiable outgrower schemes to fund these farmers. So we give this out to farmers as input credit at the end of the season, which is four months, maximum five, six months. You have done re your recoveries, you pay them. So farmers do not have to go and chase loans and look for money to farm. Mm. That's one of the things. So, so, so when we were talking about rice earlier, I was telling you that it's a function of money. Senior so was talking about um, the various malls. Where, where do they get their, their funding from? It is that which determines which goes on their shelves. Mm. Because somebody is producing in their country, somebody would fund you to uptake those products, to go and sell in Ghana, so mm. their, their, their manufacturing works. So if we don't have the money, we still have the wherewithal and the capacity yeah, and opportunity to use policy mm -hmm. to make the inputs available. We farmed 1,000 acres of rice last year. Yeah. It cost us then about 2,000 cities per acre mm -hmm. to provide inputs for our farmers. Mm -hmm. Now it's going to cost me a little over 3,000 cities per acre. If it's the same money I'm going to turn around, I cannot do 1,000 cities. I would have to do about mm -hmm. 600 uh, 1,000 acres, I would have to do about 600 mm -hmm. acres. But the, the Yaris, the OCPs, all these big fertilizer companies wh who bring in inputs. Now, these we can use policy to get these companies to actively play in supporting farmers, whether large-scale farmers and outgrowers. Because the product lands in Ghana, four months we've worked with it, we do our recoveries, we pay you. Senior meal gets to meal rice because there's a standard that the yields are there, so he gets enough rice. Mm -hmm. He gets it all year round because we'll do major season, mm -hmm. we'll do minor season. Then you won't only see Ghana rice on the market for Christmas and Easter alone. Mm -hmm. If we want to feed Ghanaians, our rice consumption is about 35 kilograms per capita. So every person eats 35 kilograms a year. Now this brings us to, let's say, you let's use a flat figure, 1 million tons of rice. Do we have enough land? Yes. Do you have enough water? The water that flows on the surface of Ghana, which our government is sitting idle for people to destroy, mm. destroy. Mm. through Galamse, is enough to serve the whole of West Africa's domestic, industrial, and agricultural needs. Over 56 billion cubic meters yeah, of water. The Volta Enclave alone can do all the farming we need if we are developing those things. So we don't need money. We don't need we need smart policy, smart thinking to get some of these things working, le, which le, we have failed to do. Le, let me bring in uh, John Aouni, who is uh, on, on the line now. John, you are an agri business consultant. Uh, the more I listen to Kujo and Senyo, the more I realize that look, there is there is so much independence Too much, that's true. in the in the production of 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 rice. Everybody is doing their own thing. Right? So those who put in the time, the money, the thinking, the effort, they get good products. Those who, you know, just give it a go, don't. 
So there is no standardization. There is nothing. There doesn't seem to be any kind of unified effort. No. Is that the missing link here? Should, should rice producers just get organized and start singing from the same hymn sheet? Thank, thank you very much, Kujo. And good morning to my colleagues on, in the studio. Honestly, I, they have made very, very great points uh, uh, listening to them. But I would have suggested to the station for us to have a very meaningful scientific discussion, discussion that will have impact on the development of the country and the industry, to have segmented the discussion into production, processing, Same. and marketing. Yes. It's a huge thing that we are dealing with. And remember, I'm also uh, I'm the former president of Ghana Rice is a professional body. I was the president in 2004, 5, 6, 7, and 8. Mm. So I have gone around this entire country. I think the only region I haven't been to in this country dealing with rice is Upper West region. But any corner they produce rice in this country, God be my witness, I have been there and have dealt with farming. And I would say that you don't wake up one morning and say that you want to stop importation of rice or you want to produce rice. It's supposed to be a great effort, a collective thing, and it's supposed to be a government thing. Mm. No private individual can independently produce rice in this country to feed the country and reduce imports. In 2001, when the president, uh, when the president Kufuor's government came into power, they put together a team. Then the late Kodis Kwashiga was the Minister of Agri. Yeah. I was one of the people they put together to see how we can boost rice production in the country. And it is through our efforts that we got uh, in that era, we reduced rice importation by 30%. Mm. And we went through production, processing, and then uh, the marketing element, which my colleagues in the studio have touched variously. Mm. So it is not only standardization that is a missing link. Government has done nothing over the years to warrant any call on the reduction of uh, or, or suspension of the importation of rice. Any mm -hmm. effort that goes in that direction will, will exacerbate food security problem in the country. Any effort that goes in that direction will only punish the Ghanaian consumer. In Ghana, we have the land size. We have available land to produce rice. We have the capacity to produce rice in terms of availability of land. But we have to be very uh, scientific. Currently, as my colleague said, we, we import about 1 million tons of rice in the country. As of last year, 2022, we had imported about, uh, about 800,000 about 800, metric tons of rice. If you ask how much rice we produce locally, we don't know. <laughs> oh, somebody has spoken. We <laughs> have no idea about how much rice we produce in this country. That's a problem. Because we are not organized. If you go and ask the Minister of Agri that how much rice we produce in this country, and the 800,000 metric tons of rice that we, we imported, it's milled rice, it's not paddy rice. So in this country, when you, if you don't know where you are produced, you don't even know what your base, how can you start saying that you are cutting down imports, you are, it is time nobody should import, you are suspending forex and then all that. Good thing but knee-jerk reaction. You don't wake up in the midst of trouble and say that I'm no longer going to do this when you were not prepared for that. Hmm. Paddy rice is what we are producing, like my friends, Google, all whatever they are talking about. If you ask them how much rice they produce, they will tell you that we are producing this, maybe in meals, because they are mailing and they know the quantity. But collectively, yeah, assuming we are producing like 250,000 metric tons of Local, uh, local rice. That is paddy rice. How do you convert it? Normally, we have a standard rate of about 0 
convert it to milk. But that is mm. not what they do abroad. Mm. Again, our people talked, my friends talked about uh, uh, the water and then all that. You cannot say you are suspending rice, in product, rice importation in this country when you have no control over water, your water production. Mm. Do you have any control over rain? Who can tell us? Even sometimes our metro department predicts rainfall and the rain doesn't come. I say, I don't know. <laughs> My brother produces a, a, a soya bean. In, 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 uh, he farms soya bean in Tamale. He went and then planted the seeds over 100, over 100 hectares of land. The rain did not come. To so no gem, poor germination. And we are dealing, and soya beans even able to withstand uh, drought. What about rice? Rice is a water loving crop. So for us to have, a, to, 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 to have arrived where we are now, to say that we are talking about the must patronize locally produced rice and all that, our local, produ our local rice is just a seasonal rice. Hmm. It's seasonal. When it comes in, remember, Kojo, two, two, two years ago, the Minister of Agric said they were going to, and nobody, before you import rice, you must come to the minister and prove that you are going to, you are selling this quantity of local rice. Mm. I'm an executive member of the Food and Beverage Association. The players did all that. They went to the ministry. After it took one, two, three, four months, nothing happened. People searched for the rice. They couldn't find not because people are not willing to sell, not because people are not willing to uh, uh, produce, but they don't have the capacity. They don't have the, uh, the, the things put in place by government has not been done. So jo jo we need about a 10 year period, consistent investment in the agri sector to be able to make meaningful impact. Hmm. There are two things I say in this country, poultry and then rice. We may not need to import it, but you don't wake up one morning to do that. Right. John, I think, I think you're pointing to something quite obvious here, that maybe the focus should not be on us just calling on people to consume locally made rice. No. Th there is a lot of work that needs to be done before we tell Ghanaians, stop buying foreign, start buying local. Exactly. Okay, but you're saying that that work is not to be done by the individual rice producers or um, no. uh, marketers or processors. It's no. government work. It's a government work. Like I said, you can't be depending on rainfall to produce your rice. 15% of the rice produced in this country or the crops produced in this country is under irrigation. And like my friend, one of my colleagues said, it's not only for rice. It's shared vegetables and then all yeah. other things. Yeah. So if you want to produce rice, you need to have, if not even a irrigation, you need to have boreholes dotted all over. You need to invest on water resources. You need to be able to identify the gaps. For instance, you want to cut down importation of 800,000 metric tons of rice into the country. What land size do you require? Oh. Mm. What land size do you How require? Many How many farmers do you need to do that? Machinery. You see, so the, the seed and all that my friend talked about, one of the things I discovered, and I tried to work with farmers in the entire country when I was a president, is this standardization. You, cannot, you need to go to about... A hand, a, about a 1,000, 2,000 um, land, land space, and you should have the same variety. But one person cannot be producing tox, three, four, five, another one producing, another one, another one producing within the same land space. So when you are, they are talking about gogo -go rice, gogo -go rice, maybe gogo -go rice, you are producing only about 1,000 metric tons of rice. And so when gogo -go rice is finished, you go and buy another one, it's a different variety. And that is not it. The other thing we are talking about is that a bulk of the rice produced comes from the northern regions. The northern regions. The northern regions have a certain climate. And the rice that is produced there cannot be straight milled. There is a certain moisture content that is supposed to be in the rice before you can straight mill it. 
Unfortunately, the rice, bulk of the rice produced in the north cannot be street milk. So you will have to parboil it. Ghanaians will eat parboil rice. It's Nigerians that eat parboil rice. You will require yeah, investment rice, uh, in the, in the Niger. north to be able to harvest rice at a certain moisture level in order to be able to straight meal it. Because you cannot change the taste of the Ghanaian from straight milled white rice to parboiled rice. Where is that investment? Sometimes your rice is ready to be harvested in the north, and yet you don't have a combined harvester to go in there. John, so I, I, you have to leave it until the time the, the combined harvesters are available for you yeah. to come and for them to come and have it. By which time the moisture level would have dropped drastically. Right. John, you. So it's a major thing. Yeah. And I think that the government, not only this particular government, but governments over the years have only used talk, 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 but no action. The Minister of Agri has no data. They have no data, proper data, scientific hmm. data on our production systems in this country. And for us to begin, policy can only be made effectively when we have good data. You can't be seen to say you are cooking food for people when you don't know the number of people you are cooking that food for. Hmm. It's a major thing, and it's a, I really thank Joy FM for beginning this discussion. Let us sustain it. Let us bring in more people. And it's not just the talk talk, but let us talk more scientific, more educated, less propaganda. Okay. Uh, John, you've given us a lot to think about, along with Kojo and, and Singyo. We're going to uh, take a few messages. When we come back, let's tackle that cost issue. We've got, uh, you know, we've got producers of rice right here. They'll tell us what goes into it, why they put that price tag on it when it gets to the market. Let's, let's get an understanding of that. Compare it to the economics of bringing rice all the way from uh, somebody's silo in Thailand to Ghana. Why that process? results in a cheaper product than the one that was grown just down the road. Okay. During the break, we were thinking about something. One thing is obvious from everything we've heard from Kujo, from Singo, from John. That at the moment, the missing link or the gap in the process, the thing that will make this whole thing come together and work, is something that we are looking to government to do to provide the policy, to provide the enabling environment, to provide the support where necessary, and the leadership, obviously, so that the things that are lacking, you know, um, whether it's um, uh, know-how, you know, to standardize the quality, whether it's um, uh, irrigation, uh, whether it's scientific research, in order to ensure we have the right seedlings that can improve the yield, all those things are things we are looking to government to do. Okay. Kojo Senyo and John, government will not do it. Can I just say that and, and so we can move on from it? No, not necessarily. Government will not do I mean, so I, it. So I, I think that there's a structure Successive governments for it. have not done it. Yes. So if we look to them to do it, we are looking in the wrong direction. So I have a plan. Okay. That's my question now. My question is, how much of this can we do without government? No, so you, you, you are going to need government. It doesn't mean government spending its own resources to do so many things. Certain things it may have to do with. All you need is a, is a policy structured frame to enable capital to flow into the sector sustainably. So one, you're working on standardization. Standardization is not a function of, uh, of spending so much money anywhere. The standards exist by trying to create clear policies, clear rules and regulations governing the sector. It's a totally unregulated sector. All right, those things don't exist. I'll give you an example. We are in one of the irrigation schemes. We've taken a lease for about 500 hectares. I am, I've paid for the lease. But because of some historical issues, the Irrigation Authority, that sits under the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Ministry of Foreign Affairs? Ministry, Ministry of, of, Foreign of Foreign Agriculture, Food and Agriculture, Mofa, Charlie. Thanks, <laughs> Correction, thanks. Which is there, it's, um, still has a certain kind of legacy arrangement with the community folks. We have no problems with that. But now what happens now is that when I spend money in there, I can't actually even take control over the land. So you have been given the house, but I don't have the key. So you practically have to work with the farmers, which is 
part of our social model as AGL, which is okay. But now the farmers, after you fund them, will now decide when, whether they will still sell the party back to you or not. In our instance, we actually have a fair party pricing. So I don't lock in a low price for you. And then when it comes, the prices are higher, then you feel like I've, I'm cheating, you know. We'll fund you fully. When it comes, when, and the harvest is there, we'll manage the process, give you the agronomy A to Z. We'll harvest for you. But we'll price it at the market price on the, on the day. So the farmers are comfortable. But people now start taking discretions. They say, okay, no, the party, I won't even give it to you. How much did you spend? I'll give you. Meanwhile, I paid for the land. Then this guy takes it, goes to just walk to another mill. Most anything, packages anyhow, and sends it. These things are going out unregulated. Are you giving, putting a reward scheme for those of us who are investing to make sure there are standards? There's none. You want to really put in a class structure. Today, even that particular scheme, we are trying to expand what government has so that we can actually take a lot more control of our existing fields, maybe by another 100 hectares. The next minute, what you just hear is that government has sent a policy directive that all the lands or opportunities should practically go to one man in the country. What, what sense are you making of, 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 of Kuju, myself, who have been investing in this sector all this while? We want standards. If government takes a policy and says, look, for this area, these are the seeds that are supposed to be planted in this area. Looking at the science, looking at the structure, this is what is required. Everybody knows that when I go into this area, I'm just finding X biker. If I go into this area, I'm finding just jasmine, just like I, I cited in Thailand. And to minimize the agency costs that's required for Kojo or myself to try and vet line by line to make sure the party that we are even taking is really this standard or it's not this standard. Because the whole process is pretty well regulated. You know what kind of quality you are getting. The stress is low. You definitely have to do some 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 other kind of test. We don't have that kind of support support system well, whatsoever. So you are always battling. The key thing that um, I think John also buttressed that is the irrigation thing. Government irrigation is expensive. Let's get it right. Mm. But there's irrigation facilities. What government wants you to should be looking at doing now, if I'm going to find Kojo, I'm going to find Senior, I'm going to find whoever has been in the sector, or the Rice Millers Association of Ghana. Guys, we really want to move to point X. This is the resource we currently have. If the banks can work the sense and the science in there, the banks will be able to fund almost all of these projects. And the other one that we proposed the last time, we should have a rise development levy. That a rise, a development, rise development levy. levy. A rise development levy charged on imports. But the fund cannot be managed by government. They've not managed exim fund well. They can't they don't manage any fund well. So but you must have, manage it. You should have a, a private sector led a private sector and government sector and academia structured fund. So government will collect the le the money. So we have the and it goes into the fund. And there's a clear thing. You have the academia in there. You have um, you have we the operatives there. Government itself should also sit in there. And then the fund is managed from that point. So you still need government. So you need still need government. But you see, government is not really going to have to start digging his hands into directly into into his coffers today. What you are doing right now, like I cited, when you say you're not giving these importers there. FX. The rice will still have to be eaten for cost of food security. So we will import. But I want to import with more expensive FX. The only person making money from this policy is the FX trader. But that money should rather be channeled into the development of rice. So government can say, I'm using this. I'm going to really build the primary infrastructure for, for from this development levy for irrigation. We're not going to irrigate all the fields. We'll earmark all the fields. When we earmark all the fields, now Kojo will come and say, look, I actually need lot one, two, three. So with his bank, he can actually get capital to actually now expand the canals to his side. Government cannot also be working with LUSPA. Define all the lands that are fit for rice. And when you define all the lands that are fit for rice, and you zone it and designate it for rice, when Kojo Yangtze wants to come and invest in rice. He will not spend one year going back and forth trying to perfect title about which land he will get, which land he won't get. Spend money, pay too many brokers who end up ripping him. And at a point, he just gives up. You, these are not things that need super money. It needs policy. It needs focus. And it needs you to start with how you really, what you want to sell and how you want to sell it. The variety. What is the variety? He said 120,000. Ghana doesn't need a 120,000. We know the palate of Ghanaians. Mm. You don't just say, I'm looking for something with just high yield. What do the customers want? They want jasmine-like rice. So get jasmine rice for them. What type can we do? 
You Let's get perfume them. rice. You made perfume rice, uh -huh, yes. Perfume rice. So you want perfume rice? That's what we want to give you. If we want to come up with another category because of of mm. economics, let's define it. Look for the areas that we'll be able to find. We can, we can grow this, and that is science. CSIR is there. It has a budget. Government must invest a bit more in it. When you do that, and I come to CSIR, I know that this zone that we are going, I'm going to Tamale Tamil South. I'm going to Weta. I'm going to Adaklu. This is the type of rice that is supposed to be grown here. The variety is here. Government will control who produces it. The banks will fund it. When I know that I don't have to think too hard where I'll get my right quality seeds, all right, I can only focus on my mailing or my agronomy. Then my banks can easily find it possible to fund me. Thankfully, we have Gessal. Gessal is doing a great job. Kwesi Kwaboy and team I would offer our hearts to you. With the banks, money will flow into it, but you have to de-risk the structure because there's too much uncertainty. There's so much I mean, uh, what opacity that does not help banks easily throw money inside agriculture and to the bottleneck it. It doesn't just need money, it just needs you structuring the industry. It's a policy matter. So, government will be there, but it doesn't mean that government needs to move money. This 27 billion that they have in the, in the, in the, in the budget for capital expenditure, if they rather focus after taking the 6 billion to pay us for uh, the bondholders and the collective investment schemes for this year. And letting my people go at least they will have about 21 billion they should take money from there and rather spend it on infrastructure critical for sustainable agri development and not be it so the point i was making at the beginning is that there are things governments should do but they won't do them i think they have proved successive governments by the way we have they have proved them. over time that they won't do these things so is there a way to get them done without government? That's what I'm thinking yeah. of. And there's another reason why they won't do it, Kojo, just before I... I, I yeah, so, you. There's so, another so. reason. The reason is that some people in government positions benefit from the importation of rice. They benefit. Mm -hmm. It is in their interest to make things easier for importers to bring in rice than it is for them to make things easier for local rice producers to produce rice. So all of these things mitigate against the will for them to do some of these brilliant suggestions that Senyo has suggested. So again, to you, my question, could you, can it be done without government? It cannot be done entirely without government, but it's a, a matter of partnerships. Um, if you followed me on Facebook consistently, I've been writing about agro-industrial enclaves. Now, if you want to do farming, and this is not just a rice problem, any type of farming, you need land. Even if it's industrial, aeroponics, whatever, your structure will be built on land. So you need land. The last time I went to the eastern region to go and look for land, they were offering land for 5,000 cities per acre. If you need 100 acres to do maize, for example, do <coughs> the maths, who has that money to of load for land just like that. So that's one of the biggest challenges. Now, if we had a partnership between traditional landowners, farmers, communities, and industry, we could make land available for production. And I have a scenario. Look at Bojasi. It's just close to the Greater Accra region, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's just here. If the landowners at Bojasi are brought together to allocate 2,000 acres just by that their stream, and you're even using um, um, maize as an example for production, 2,000 acres, allocate 10 acres per person. So take 1,000 acres and allocate 10 acres per community. And, and you know the population of the, so you can have a lot of people engaged. Have 1,000 acres for a commercial producer, just split it in two. If they're making 30 bags of maize per acre, could you want to do the maths? 2,000 acre acres. If 2, are making th yes. So that's 60,000. No, 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 no. 2,000 times 30 yeah 60,000 yeah. a bag of maize is 200 cities now so do the math for me okay so 60,000 bags mm -hmm. times how much is a bag 200 cities 200 that's uh, 12 million that's 12 million per production cycle added to the budget economy now the people taking the lands are not buying the land they are renting or leasing the land but they will pay with a bag of maize per acre. Mm -hmm. So the chiefs and the landowners are going to get 2,000 bags from 2,000 times 200. How much is it? Mm -hmm. 
thousand times two hundred. That should be a four uh, four million two thousand four hundred thousand four hundred thousand. Yeah, right. Yeah, that is the revenue per planting season that's going to the landowners from that two thousand acres. Now, the reason why I said it's a partnership is that the government then with the power of the state and the money and the machinery and look all these galam say machinery we are using to destroy our water bodies mm. they are the same machinery we use for land development could then have a structure to do land development and and this that state apparatus and the partnership within there could also take a, 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 a one one bag per acre which is four hundred thousand cities to that apparatus that is doing the land development per season the farmers based on who they are taking their input credit from are also going to pay their inputs mm. With, with grain. So in the end, if you do the maths per, per farmer for 10 acres, each farmer could pay themselves, if you spread the returns they are getting every year from their production, about 4,000 CDs a month from planting peas, maize on 10 acres. We want to create jobs. We have the lands. We have the people who need the jobs. We have the water. We just need smart partnership arrangements to have simple agro-industrial zones in every community so when we said we're doing one village one dam right what were we building the dams for because if you go up north the farms are scattered mm. so if you are building a dam doesn't mean i have to carry a bucket to the dam or a truck to the and but you can build these dams and build these 1000 acre lots around the dams and have simple irrigation solutions mm. so during the rainy season we um, um, senior mentioned luspa and our irrigation development authority and our Ghana Institution of Engineering, surveyors go and do the mapping, know where the um, er erosion patterns patterns are, we can capture and store water during the rainy season for all year round farming. These are some of the strategies. Now, if Senor knows that there is this thousand acre rice enclave here, and this system is working, Senor knows everybody is planting the same variety, then yeah. he will go and buy himself a 0 0.5 ton per hour or a one ton per hour rice mill and come and situate it there. Mm. buy the paddy and mill. Senior could even give them the input credit. So the average farmer doesn't have to wake up beginning of the year thinking of where to get capital to work. Mm. Because the structure is such that it's a unique partnership which doesn't require everybody to find credit. Mm. The main people who would need the money are the person supplying the input because they are importing all the fertilizer. We don't we don't produce any fertilizer in this country. Yeah. It's just organic fertilizer. Whatever we do is blending. So they are importing. So that's the financial arrangement. Mm. So at the state level if we want to make it even better, <coughs> we don't even have to put some of the levies we are putting on fertilizer on fertilizer. These things must come in easily so that these people can work. So that's an example of how to get land to farm, which doesn't require much. So when the government launched the economic enclave project, for example, I was one of the people who said, it's a smart thing, so I'll lend my, my, my support and idea to it. If we do it well and have these enclaves, Senor doesn't have to go and look for money to develop any irrigation. So, uh, and I'm, land. I'm coming, I'm coming. Now, that's just one thing. Now, the other thing, let's look at um, 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 Milling, because we've, we've spoken about a lot of things, and Senor, I'm surprised you didn't mention Milling. Once the rice is grown and dried and everything, to get it on your table from paddy into this nicely packaged rice, mm. we need to be able to mill. By the way, go to our Facebook page. Uh, you, you can have an, uh, a look at an example of um, Senyo's uh, locally produced Google rice. Uh, we, have, we have it laid out on our, our table here. Go and check it out. We and uh, AVV rice is also displayed on our screen behind us. Uh, just go and look at what Ghanaians are making. We need to be able to mill. Now, at the moment, almost all our milling equipment, we import them, right? Do we have capacity for local production? And sometimes when I say some of these things, people think I live in an ideal world. I've been to Jacore's processing plant, which was purely designed and built by the Institute of Industrial Research for CSIR. Right. Purely designed and built by them. And they use it to process waste to make compost and fertilizer. Are there opportunities for some of the components of these things to be built here? There are some components we have that we're sourcing from the local markets. So it's an industrial ecological system where the food production is supporting industrial um, 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 capacity. So the people at Swami Magazine, they can build some of the silos. So your technical education that you've played games with, if rice is going to survive, rice can support that um, 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 industry. That industry can also support rice. Now, we build 
we need to build a mill. If senior is going to tell you, if you want to buy a 1.5 ton per hour mill, you need about a million CDs. Yeah. You need to, about 500,000 CDs to build that. So the capital we need and where sometimes the state has to come in, your macroeconomic management must be solid. Because if I need dollars to go and buy these things and your, and your dollar management is as bad as it is, mm. worse, the worst we've seen in the history of our economy, then it puts a lot of pressure on me. So your macro, so the state still has a role. You, you may think I that... Mean, the state always has a role. You can never t- take the that, state that, out that, of this. Yeah, I, now, on, on, on the money bits, mm. then if I need a loan, the structures we put in place to support our farmers, mm. the average farmer is going to take a loan at 30, 40... I'm taking I'm, my 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 interest rate now is almost forty, mm. but for, for so which so I so, so, so if Ken Oforiata and his wow. team are managing the economy well, mm. if we are building wealth within, we can we can we can we can get money cheaper mm. to then invest in some of these things. It's a, a big and connected thing that would need a lot more time to discuss. For example, okay. if rice survives, you'll get cheaper chicken and cheaper eggs. Because when I mill rice, the like paddy rice, the paddy rice, mm. when I mill paddy rice, let's say 50% of it will be the milled rice which has been packaged for you. Mm-hmm. You have rice bran, which can go into animal feed. Mm. You have the rice husk, which can go into paper production, mm. animal feed, um, compost production, mm. um, straw production, so many other things. All these things are going waste now. Mm. If the rice industry is, 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 is developed, it can go into a lot of the import substitution we are looking at at this particular point. Mm. If you look at our paper imports into the country, you'll be amazed. But we can still use our paper to do packaging for for, for a lot of the other things. Yeah. So it's it's a big conversation. CSIR, I'll give it to them. Huh. Over the past 10, 20, 30 years, the varieties they've produced and put on the market, it's just that you're dear my bro. Mm-hmm. We don't give them the support they need yeah. To to grow, CSR could be could could be the the, the the main ingredient to our national development, mm-hmm. but we don't support them much. Right. The Ministry of Food and Agri, I'm coming there. They also have very smart experts, but MUFA management, policy management, the people we put there, and how they manage and 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 dev- uh, uh, um, deliver the development we need. We need better people, people who are Ghana centric who understand manufacturing and Greek and the linkages to support those technocrats there to deliver what, whatever we want. If we don't do that and we're always playing games with our appointments and the kind of things we do with those ministries, we'll not get anywhere. And Ghanaians, please, there's one more point I want to make. If you take one kilogram of paper, it is the same weight as one kilogram of steel. If you take one kilogram of broken perfume rice, it's the same weight as one kilogram of long grain rice. If you eat one kilogram of broken rice, it's the same satisfaction you'll get. Let's not follow what has been marketed to us to chase <coughs> this idea of long grain. The more you chase long grain, the more you have to spend. Look, if I mill my rice and I get, say, 60% long grain, 40% broken, if I were to mix it for you, the same weight, it's the same nutrition you are getting. Mm. But we are following the form over the substance. So I package the long grain and it's more expensive for you. Let's start telling ourselves, because if it's yam you are cooking, you can cut it into large sizes and smaller sizes, depending on your preference. Let's not chase form too much to the detriment of our pockets. Mm. That's what is worrying us, because broken rice is cheaper than long grain rice. Mm. People don't like, oh, it's broken rice, it's a deal to pay. But long grain rice, when you cook it, you put it in your mouth, you chew it, it breaks in your mouth, goes through the system to be ground into fine paste for digestion to happen. So let's we, we, we've sat back for business and trade to market certain things to us as mm. the ideal, but that is not the ideal. Okay. Your one kg broken rice of the same variety mm. is equal to one kg long grain of the same variety, nutritionally and everything. Right. It's just that the sizes are different. Mm. Let's start mopping up some of those things that go waste in the markets. Yeah. Right. Um, John, I'm, I want to bring you in on this because... In my mind, we're all singing from the same hymn sheet. It is clear that there is a role government must play. Maybe the only point of departure is that I am saying they won't play it. And there are reasons why, because there are humans in these government positions. And they are motivated by self-interest, just like everybody is. And that self-interest 
leads them to do things that will favor an importer of rice over a local manufacturer. So, John, from, the, from, from your perspective, with the vast knowledge you have of this industry, how do we get around that obstacle? How do we ensure that these wonderful suggestions Senyo and Kojo have made, somebody will actually carry them out? In debt, you know, to the detriment of their self-interest, but Kujo. for the public good. Thank you. Very, very great question, Kujo. Most of the things that have been discussed in the studio there are just uh, a repetition of history. Uh, clearly, let me confirm what my colleagues have said. It's never possible to achieve anything in this direction without the involvement of government, mm. strong involvement of government. I will begin by suggesting as an expert in the industry, let the government put up a very strong patriotic team. The reason why Kuris Kwashiga achieved a lot in the area of rice and even in poultry in the 2001, 2002, 2003 was that he put together a team and he taxed us with targets. He gave us targets, and he was on us continuously. He himself was yeah, so was much country. interested in ensuring that we don't import any grain of rice into this country. That's how come he managed to succeed in reducing rice importation by 30%. Successive ministers of government, ministers of uh, agri, haven't done much. They haven't done much in that direction. We need, number one, to set up a team of experts who are very interested in ensuring that they can speak the truth to government. Experts that can advise the government and experts that can go beyond one government so that it doesn't become like NDC comes in, they dissolve the, 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 that team, put up and uh, forget about it, and then maybe later they put another. No, you need a strong team to focus on chicken, to focus on rice. I have been, in those years, I was part of those teams, poultry, rice, and all that, and I realized that we achieved a lot. We haven't, we, so we need to put that number one. Number two, we need to, to get data. The government needs to go back to data because all whatever we are talking about is just everybody's opinions. Like we are touching the elephant from different parts and describing. But the minister, for, for you to know the magnitude of the problem at hand, you will need proper data. And the minister of agri have to do that, and that has to do with government. When the, the uh, Honorable Kwesi Ahoy came to power. I went to him and I, told, I gave him a proposal. I said, listen, let's work on data. Let's gather data. So we started and started getting up rice farmers throughout the country, the size of land, the all whatever not. But at a certain point, we didn't get the funding to continue. So it was truncated. Government cannot, we cannot achieve this thing without the involvement of government. Because over the years, private sector has tried and failed. Fina Trade did it, and I led Fina Trade, and I was so passionate to ensure that we will make rice, local rice, as part of our, our, our model. We sponsored farmers all over. Nas we went to Nasia, we went to Tolo, uh, Dowenya, Pong, all, Pong, all over. You sponsor farmers, and then they will produce finish and tell that they will sell the rice to you. You can't do this without the involvement of government. The land, the size of, the, the nature of land ownership in this country requires government involvement. And some of it may involve the, uh, the formulation of laws. So if you don't involve government, and you say private sector has to do it, private sector have tried it. Talks Abimola and then his Brazilian counterpart came. We put up a meal at uh, Sogakope. And I think they are the people producing the copper. It did not work. They were so determined that they told me that, John, work with us. We are going to ensure that we don't import rice. And I said, fine, let's do it. The late, uh, the late uh, the vice president, Kwesi uh, Emisata, he went and commissioned that meal. Where is the state of that thing now? Avinash, they are in Tamale. A rice meal, we shouldn't forget about that. 
So various private players have done it before and failed. What Joy FM is doing is a great effort, and we must put pressure. That if government wants to walk the talk, they must come clean and get themselves clearly involved in leading, and private sector would follow. So that is for me, that, that is my suggestion, uh, because you don't have ta- enough time. Mm. This is my clear in, uh, suggestion for, right. for, for it for now. Yeah. We need to set up a team, experts team, who are not interested in promoting their business, but interested in promoting the business of Ghana to mm. ensure that we can have sufficient chicken production in this country, Magato which too. we are capable of doing, sufficient rice production in this country, which we are very much capable of doing. Mm. And then we can then uh, move forward in that direction. But yeah. not to begin to talk and say the government will not do it. Government, see, right. the amount of money government gets from imports is enough motivation to ensure that we don't produce a lot of local rice in this country. Because any time imports fall short, government revenue also falls short. Yeah. John Senyo Hankojo, I can't thank you enough for the time you spent with us this morning. You've given us a certain peek into an industry that many of us have only been looking at from the outside. And we definitely appreciate it. Now it's clear what is needed. Uh, how to get it done is step two. So this conversation can only be the beginning of a big national one, which is, uh, you know, which we must occupy ourselves with in the coming weeks. So I want to thank you both very much uh, for your time with us this morning. And uh, also, John, who is on the phone, we appreciate you all so much. Ah, goodness. Simple things. Simple things and with simple you. solutions. Senor says he's giving Raymond a year supply of rice to let him know that Ghana rice actually rocks. Uh-huh. In fact, I think we should have a rice fair right in front of Ghana. Uh, uh, of Joy FM. I'll tell you People what. should come and just eat. I'll tell you what. We've come. actually, th- we've we'll actually, just, we'll we've just actually thought of that. A rice before, market. You come and get your wachi, you come and get your jollof, you get your Google wachi, you get your Google jollof, which is the jollof master. Rice wine. You go to your rice wine. I don't know about that one for now. But <laughs> <laughs> it's also very, very important. But it's the important. Rice wine. Right there. Some rice wine. Then, then we'll, do, we'll do the thing right here. People should come yeah. and taste it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, Look, I, I, my, only, my only plea to Ghanaians. Don't just judge one experience with a Ghanaian made rice and extend that experience mm. as judgment on all rice that is made in Ghana. Yeah. Gogo rice is gogo rice. FVV rice is FVV rice. Mm. When you try VV rice and you don't like it, you don't like it. If you try gogo rice, you don't like it, then you don't like gogo rice. It doesn't mean you don't like Ghana rice. Mm. But when you try VV rice and gogo rice, I can assure you, you will eat anything <laughs> again. The only thing is that you have to know the mechanics of it. Mm. One, these are fresh crops, fresh produce. Just a little water. So you use less water. That's the first thing yeah. everybody needs to know. Yeah. This one is not overly stored. We don't put in chemicals to give it perfume. Nothing. It is natural. There's no chemical anywhere. This is the variety. Yeah. Fresh, 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 fresh. This is made right here in Ghana. You don't have anything happening on the sea. Yeah. You don't have to put any phytosanitary as you currently eat. The one that you've been eating from outside, you have to phytosanitary chemicals are all part of it. I'm just telling you. But you, you get something that frees you off all of this. And you have standards like the food, food uh, FDA here yeah. mm. who supervise and make Senor, sure that these plants let's, are let's solid. Give, let's give something Ghanaian should think about. For every plate of jollof rice you eat, if you bought Ghana rice, you are supporting six jobs. The farmer, the driver, the processor, the packager, the marketer, and the miller. And the radio Every that plate be for us. of jollof you <laughs> eat, or angwamo you eat, or mm. any rice dish you eat, if it's made in Ghana, you're supporting six jobs. For every plate of imported rice you eat, you are denying us those six jobs. If you want all of us to be broke, make your choice. The if you want us to be wealthy broke. together, make sure make your choice. We are not democratizing brokenness. You so. and yeah, right. the, the rice balls is in your court. Hey. Thank you all so much uh, for your time with us.